Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous moonlit night. It is Saturday night. Full moon. I think it's the super moon here tonight on Saturday night, February 8th, 2020. And uh, a little dog and I have been out planet nibbling all day long. We are exhausted. I have a uh, Charlie horse in my leg, which is killing me. I am getting too old for planet nibbling. But anyway, since I have such a full day tomorrow, which is Sunday, February 9th, 2020, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, before I call it a night on my big Saturday night partying here in the end, uh, in the collapse of global industrial civilization, going to uh, do what I try to do every Sunday where I, I love Sunday because I get to wear both of my hats or non hats here on YouTube and you can figure out that comment uh, where I can bring you both my doomsday sermon for Sunday on that one channel and Monday's Chronicle of the Collapse and before I dive into this uh, week's sermon slash chronicle, I want to send out a big thank you for a kind-hearted tribes member, Jess Soyo, Jess Soyo, for becoming my newest patron here on YouTube in the small, in the exclusive club, and uh, anyone who has ever supported me on uh YouTube, doing whatever it is that I do, uh, I really, really do support it. So anyway, guys, uh, I am getting ready to interview this young man whose name I don't know how to pronounce. He is from Portugal, J-O-A-O -O with a little thing over the A, A-B-E-G-A-O -E with a little thing over the A. I'm going to probably embarrass myself, and we're going to try Joao Abigail. We're going to take a wild guess. We'll see how much I butchered that on Monday. I am an American. Uh, this is one of our afflictions. So, uh, <coughs> Joao Abigail, if that's how you pronounce your name, uh, has made the horrendous error in judgment in his life to apparently th this young man is going to dedicate his life to maybe becoming the new Paul Ehrlich, uh, trying, he, he's taking on the challenge of convincing the planet that overpopulation, overpopulation is the backbone of every single environmental problem on this planet, ensuring himself of a lifetime of ridicule, uh, trolls from the right and the left. Speaking of which, trolls from the left, uh, now, he wrote this essay, he has this excellent website, uh, the it's simply called overpopulationatlas.com. He has volume one of Overpopulation Atlas coming out with volume two here shortly, which we're going to be talking about in this interview. Uh, he has this essay, which I have to admit I am too chicken to read, particularly over at Collapse Chronicles. The Triad of Furies, Human Overpopulation, Immigration, and Reproduction Rights, uh, where, where he gets himself in all kinds of troubles with both the right and the left, where he pulls off the gloves uh, t talking to the social justice warriors. And uh, as much as I would love to uh, stir up some stuff, I need to uh, remember where I am 
And while I am cheering uh, Joao on for the triad of furies, we're going to get a little bit tamer on from overpopulationatlas.com where he has all sorts of uh, excellent essays. I mean, this young man gets it. He understands the biggest problem on this planet is too many people. Uh, but we're going out of all of my choices. I'm going to center on where the wild things were is where humans are now. This was written uh, in October of last year, about five months ago. So take it away, Joao, and uh, tell us about this. This the full paper. This is somewhat uh, a an edited version. The full paper was published in the Journal of Human Ecology, and there's links to it, and there's all sorts of links here. Uh, so this is the condensed version of this excellent essay. Okay, let's dive right in. <clears throat> I'll be honest, I have a very unusual hobby. Whenever I have the chance, I like to attend conferences, seminars, or other scientific gatherings of minds in all sorts of areas of knowledge. Not just by being passionately curious, as Albert Einstein said, but also because I revel in agitating the conventional flow of these meetings by merely asking questions. I, uh, I, I have already emailed uh, Sarah Lim saying that she needs to marry this man. Uh, they would be the doomer the doomer couple of the world. But anyway, I think Sarah already has a fiancé. But enough of Sarah Lim's uh, personal life uh, getting back to uh, this essay. Okay. The one question that I have been regularly asking, especially where the orators and audience ought to be aware of our environmental and existential quandary is, what are your reasons to remain optimistic? Although it is a seemingly simple question, it is enough to give pause even to the, the most idealistic and assured of speakers. Even so, the self-defense mechanism soon kicks in and their reactions flood the auditoriums. Millions lifted out of poverty. Longer average lifespans. Humans are safer, healthier, freer, and happier than in any other point in history, which of course, of course we might recognize as that clueless moron Steven Pinker. I ought, to get, I ought to get Mr. Pinker on the show. Anyway, more reasons for optimism. The transition to sources of renewable energy. Food production outpaced population growth fleets of electric vehicles, aquaculture, and other prospects for ending famine, autonomous vehicles saving hundreds of thousands of lives, vaccines, genetically engineered solutions, and the eradication of diseases, smart cities, awareness of plastic pollution and consequent bans, environmental activism and youth movements, the fourth industrial revolution, also known as artificial intelligence, creating more jobs than the rate of displacement or even the end of work, a new space age, and 
asteroid mining. For examples of enthusiastic romanticizing of the future, check here, here, or here. He goes on in this vein. Uh, you could, he has all of these links so if you want to keep following the list of the apocalyptimist. Okay. All of these concepts, ideas, trends, and forecasts are indeed wonderful in the lens of improving the human condition. It is unquestionably hard to argue with Steven Pinker's line of reasoning that if a human could choose a time to be alive, he or she should consider the late 20th century and the 21st century. If you're a human, honestly, this is the best time to be alive, as Tony Allen Mills writes. But therein lies the rub. For all the human development, progress, and advancement that have enabled this golden age to take shape, something else had to give. That something else is the living planet we all inhabit, as well as the non-human species with which we ought to share this earth, but are instead driving out, which is a euphemism for large-scale ecocide. Where the wild things were is where humans are now. An overview is a small attempt to describe that atrocity. The massive outbreak and the growth of humans roaming this planet has not been without consequences to the natural world. Through our immense dispersion and consumption of natural resources, Homo sapiens has been absorbing the material bedrock necessary for their survival. Indeed, our biophysical reality is remarkably straightforward. The 7.6 billion plus the roughly 80 million added annually request some proportion of manufactured capital. capital. This includes homes, infrastructures, personal vehicles, technology, furniture, toys, clothing, on top of other essentials such as food, water, and energy. Consequently, the enlargement of the human population, the energy consumption growth by a factor of 25 and 100 factor burst of real gross world product demand a continuous and increasing withdrawal of energy and materials from the natural world, leading to an unsustainable breaching of carrying capacities, which in turn have produced the scenario of overshoot we already find ourselves in. The current unsustainability crisis requires us to pose the question of not just how to find a way of feeding 10 billion humans in roughly three decades, but also how can we possibly do that without destroying the natural world in the process. <clears throat> As the report Creating a Sustainable Food Future published by the World Resource Institute forewarns, quote, if today's level of production efficiency were to remain constant through 2050, then feeding the planet would 
read will entail clearing most of the world's remaining forest. I would say all the world's remaining forest. Wiping out thousands more species and releasing enough greenhouse gas emissions to exceed the one and a half and to see warming targets enshrined in the Paris Agreement, even if emissions from all other human activities were entirely eliminated, close quote. Undeniably, providing for the essential nourishment as well as the redundant cravings of billions has induced the death of many animal and populations, wiped out species and subspecies, precipitated collapsing ecologies, disseminated biohomogeneity, as well as the overthrowing of wild places, the seizure of the natural world to serve a human scheme materializes in the reduction of ocean life to food and bycatch, rainforests destroyed for meat, soybeans, palm oil, and timber, boreal and temperate forests overthrown for their wood, pulp, and energy resources, mountains and underground shale fulminated for coal and natural gas, deep sea floors punctured for oil and suppressed of life by deep water fishing, and uh, don't forget deep sea mining uh, to add to that list, the coup de gras of the oceans, deep sea mining, grasslands overgrazed or converted into strictly human bread baskets, and freshwater bodies funneled, dumped in, overfished, and fragmented. In light of this, worldwide animals are being killed at an unprecedented pace, either expelled or killed for their meat and lucrative body parts, revealing exceptionally rapid losses of biodiversity above the background extinction rate, and of course, where natural areas and non-human beings do not ebb directly, they take indirect hits from anthropogenic climate change and pollution, which are aggravated by human population growth. Given the increasing evidence of damage towards the natural world, one should give some thought to what world we will be inhabiting in three decades when it is projected to contain over two billion additional human passengers. Such a rapid population growth in conjunction with rising affluence will translate into roughly 50% more global food demand while the requisition for animal-based foods such as meat and dairy products is contemplated to soar by 70%. The need to feed the 3.2 billion people and rising that depend on fish reserves for their sources of proteins is leading to the collapse of fisheries worldwide, with fish stocks along the Asia-Pacific coastlines predicted to be unable to provide for the dietary needs of the world's most populous region, circa 2048. 2048 has long been mentioned, the doomsday for the oceans. 
explicitly commercial fishing now covers a higher surface more than 55 percent of the ocean area than agriculture four times as large besides merely five countries are responsible for 85 percent of all commercial fishing measured by million hours at sea for which China for which China alone is accountable for half of all hours thus raising some vital questions to the current health of the oceans in the face of an overwhelming need to feed more people with more purchasing capacity. <clears throat> so, how can we effectively cease our assault on the biosphere when the dietary needs of one growing species are responsible for such unprecedented demands on the living systems of the planet? But, even if all of humanity were to maintain levels of consumption of resources on par with just sustenance and survival, current numbers would still imply profound ecological damage. Human beings seek to satiate not only their indispensable needs, but also in to indulge in other gratuitous wants to maximize comfort and well-being. As the po population ethicist Karen Kuhleman impeccably affirms, quote, all human beings engage in at least subsistence level consumption and virtually all either already consume more than required for their survival or would if given the opportunity. This has led to the formation of two critical problems that define our day and age. The first one is the egregious issue of wealth inequality marked by the fact that 26 individuals, 26 individuals now own as much as the poorest 3.8 billion people. Fortunately, this one is and ought to be solved by an adequate distribution or taxing of extreme wealth. Sounds a little bit like Elizabeth Warren here. Uh, the other one is not really a problem as much as it is an impasse. By increasing the purchasing power of the whole of humanity, one would improve the lives of many, but also expedite all of our existing environmental problems. Uh, a previous blog, The Triad of Furies, approaches this topic in more detail. And uh, where he, uh, this is where Joao uh, j just rips a new one. Uh, you know, to the to the lefties, basically, to the social justice warriors, to the UN sustainability goals, to the feminists who have taken over the overpopulation debate, to the mainstream environmental organizations. Anyway, as I say, uh, you can go on overpopul relationatlas.com and read the Triad of the Furies for more on this dicey subject. <clears throat> okay. Although the focus of media attention has centered on the few individuals that control an outrageous chunk of wealth and their resultant impacts on the environment, one has to wonder, 
if the sudden rise of the global middle class, now roughly 3.7 billion people, growing by 160 million per year, is not more problematic for our efforts of attaining sustainability, given that all of these people will want to move to big to bigger and more energy costly habitations, own personal vehicles, eat higher in the food chain, travel abroad, acquire technology and other forms of manufactured capital. Additionally, they will strive to emulate the behaviors of those located higher in the wealth hierarchy aggravating an already precarious situation. Yep. Numbers matter, be it in the unfortunate concentration of wealth in a small number of privileged individuals or the rapid expansion of affluence of the rest of humanity. After all, Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett, who hold roughly the same wealth as the bottom half of Americans don't have the same resultant burdens on the planet as more than 160 million Americans since there are physical limitations to what one human can consume and so and do during his or her lifetime well unless you're Donald Trump of course then you can destroy an entire planet or unless you're Jair or Bozo Nero uh, you know anyway uh, but I know what we all know what he's talking about um, in other words even if Mr. Bezos were to continually travel around the world in his private plane and eat at the top of the food chain, it is conceivable to argue that at the same time hundreds of thousands of individuals engaging in the same behaviors would far surpass the impacts of one billionaire. The bottom line is both the creation of more opulent individuals and the surge in global purchasing power should concern those worried about the state of the planet and our most likely bumpy ride in the coming decades. The circumstances surrounding non-human life are ones of acute loss. This is epitomized by the knowledge that since the dawn of civilization, humanity has caused, has caused the loss of 83% of all wild mammals with our current with its, all the other wild animals, uh, with its current biomass numbering a mere 4%, while humans occupy 30 per, 36% and livestock an alarming 60%. To make matters worse, this biohomogeneity and the competitive displacement of species is further connected to livestock. By being not just the largest source of global habitat loss, livestock is also likely the most momentous explanation for the decline of populations of large carnivores, as well as the dramatic range contraction of large wild herbivores, such that approximately 60% are now imperiled by extinction, due to not just resource depression by livestock, but also hunting and land use changes. 
Equally important, the International Union of Con Conservation for Nature Red List of Threatened Species now encompasses 93,577 species, of which 26,197 are now considered threatened with extinction. Wildlife copiousness on the planet has diminished by as much as 60 percent between 1970 and 2016, with the biomass of insect populations having plummeted by three quarters over the previous 27 years in Germany's protected areas. Coupled with the forceful demise of insects, Ripples have begun to reverberate across the ecosystems and their trophic cascades, with the first indirect victim being insect eating birds and reptiles, as a result of the drop in the abundance of these species, food webs are being effectively reshuffled. Humanity has also plundered most of the pristine parts of the world's oceans, with roughly 13% left unclaimed by shipping, mining, and commercial fishing. Earth's land surface has also been almost thoroughly utilized with estimates pointing to 50 to 70 percent currently modified for human activities. Other sources point to less conservative assessments predicting 75 percent or even 95 percent. And put me in the camp, I would say 95 percent. It all depends on what is your De definition of being utilized by humans. Okay, let's listen to that, these marine protected areas. Marine protected areas, specifically European ones, have also revealed elevated trawling, one of the most damaging types of fishing, with activity almost 40% higher inside marine protected areas than in unprotected areas. Moreover, these areas have been shown to fail to protect endangered and critically endangered fish species. Explicitly, sharks and rays were five times more abundant outside of the marine protected areas for one thing, populations of marine vertebrates, especially predators, have dwindled by 50 to 95 percent in most oceanic regions, with the dying out of ocean megafauna reaching monumental casualties in the order of 66 to 99 percent for whale densities. Another criterion that attests the degree to which Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens is confiscating the natural world is the human appropriation of net primary production. Net primary production is the annual growth of all plant matter. It is the plant kingdom's annual output with empirical evidence increasingly establishing that HANPP is a major indicator of human pressures on ecosystems with potential detrimental repercussions on wildlife. This human appropriation of net primary production is what is amassed by people for our consumption 
plus the share of natural production absent due to environmental degradation. Another portion of HANPP is from human development that replaces living vegetation with pavement and buildings. In effect, the share of NPP seized by humans becomes unavailable to wildlife, which must then subsist on less. Given an expanding number of omnivorous human consumers with growing appetites, the organic subsistence for millions of creatures that inhabit the biosphere with us will increasingly be claimed by humans. Yes, to demonstrate at the onset of the common era, year zero, humans, so 2,000 years ago, were harvesting a moderate 0.2% with present estimates pointing to a 17 to a 25% of NPP used up or applied by humans. Also, this measurement is projected to reach 40 4% by 2050 to provide for the global increases in population, consumption, and gross domestic product. And uh, anyway, guys, uh, Joao claimed it was going to take 24 minutes to read this essay and this essay is shorter than the Furies. Uh, and this does not even include the full essay. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're going to get down, let's just get down to the last two paragraphs of the condensed version. This, as I say, this young man does his homework. Okay. In essence, the division of habitats generates a precarious situation for animals as well as humans. Animals considered to be an inconvenience risk being trapped or killed, imperiling the existence of many species that already have contracted geographical ranges and face vulnerable positions due to poaching, bushmeat hunting, and the illegal wildlife trade. Human lives also face insecurity when these breach into the habitats of species such as elephants, tigers, bears, or other large species that sense a menace and attack to defend their territory or their young. One evident example of this conflict manifests itself in 94% of the world's largest terrestrial carnivores being negatively impaired by either habitat loss or persecution due to conflict with humans. Okay, bottom line. In the long run, the long run and the short run anyway, in the long run, the considerable growth of the human population will lead to further pressure on finite land resources and to the invasion of natural areas to acquire their valuable resources or expand the human range. In order to mitigate and stem the conflict that presently afflicts several nations and which is predicted to increase as scarcity becomes an invariable and persistent condition, first on a global scale a reduction or elimination of the market of high-value natural resources should take place, 
Oh, yeah. So as to alleviate the necessity of people engaging in conflict over their monopolization, secondly, countries should employ serious efforts to manage their populations with the aim of stabilizing and eventually reducing their total human capital so as to curb Malthusian constraints, downsizing warfare and struggle while providing wildlife with a fighting chance. Yes, and the rest of this paper can be found uh, at these following links. And I skipped over a lot of this, but once again, I'm really looking forward to interviewing Joao Ab Abigail. And the first question I will ask him is, how do you pronounce your name? But anyway, if you like what uh, he had to say, please take a few minutes seconds to thumb this video up. If you did not like what you just heard, take a few seconds to thumb it down if you're a Steven Pinker fan. And uh, if you would like to subscribe while you're over here, by all means, come on board. But I have got to wrap up uh, this week's sermon and uh, today's Chronicle of the Collapse because I am about to collapse after a hard day of planet nibbling uh, here in paradise I'm gonna take one more walk around this beautiful full moon and call it night get out there and enjoy the super moon I think it's the super moon while you still can bye guys